Good morning. Welcome to our worship on this 13th Sunday after Pentecost. As we've mentioned over the past several weeks, um, in these Sundays we are being confronted by uh, challenging truths that Jesus puts in front of us. And the challenging truth today, as I'll mention actually in my message, is probably one of the hardest ones for us uh, to comprehend and grasp. Jesus is saying to us that we are to put down the things that we love and we're to pick up what you loathe. And as he does that, he is, and by the way, in your bulletin for today, I, I did have this theme along with on the slide, but I have a, um, a longer explanation in your bulletin, so if you didn't have a chance to take a look at that, please, please do so. But Jesus says something that seems really, really strange to us. He's telling us to hate uh, those that we are in a close relationship with in this world. He's telling us actually to hate our own lives, and he's telling us to hate the things that we have. So today we want to come to grasp what he means uh, by this hatred and uh, understand better uh, the cost of being a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. So with that in mind, we bow our heads in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, today as we have gathered for worship, we are truly blessed to have this time together to mutually encourage one another as we hear the wonderful message of the gospel by the power of your spirit work in our hearts today that we might gain understanding, take hold of the words that you give to us and live them to the glory of your name, not only here in your house, but every day of our lives. Let our worship bring you honor and glory as we ask these things in our Savior's name, amen. Today's worship begins with our opening hymn, which is hymn number 609. Please rise. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature, and I have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment, both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. 
Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O merciful Lord, you did not spare your only Son, but delivered him up for us all. Grant us courage and strength to take up the cross and follow him, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Our readings are the readings for the 13th Sunday after Pentecost and for our first lesson. We turn to that book where Moses gives to the children of Israel the law of God for the second time. The book of Deuteronomy, chapter 30, beginning at verse 15. And here, as he recounts the law before they enter the land of Canaan, remember it's been 40 years since God first gave his law to the Israelites at Mount Sinai. He reminds them that as they go into this land, if they choose to put the will of God into practice, they will be blessed. If they don't, then they will suffer the consequences for it. And today, as we consider uh, t picking up our cross and following Christ, putting his will into practice, it's one of the things that we will mention in our study today, that as we do so, we will reap the natural benefits of putting God's law into practice and not suffering the consequences of sinful behavior. See now, today I've set before you life, and prosperity, death, and disaster. This is what I am commanding you today. Love the Lord your God, walk in his ways, and keep his commandments, his statutes, and his ordinances. Then you will live and increase in number, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are going to possess. But if your heart turns away and you do not listen, and you are lured away and you bow down to other gods and serve them, then I declare to you today that you will most certainly perish. You will not live a long life on the land that you are about to enter and possess by crossing over the Jordan. I call the heavens and the earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, a blessing and a curse. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live by loving the Lord your God, by listening to his voice, and by clinging to him. Because that means life for you, and you will live a long life on your land that the Lord swore to give to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The word of the Lord. Be to God. Today's psalm is that psalm that depicts the contrast between the one who follows the Lord and who does not, Psalm 1. Um, our psalm is Psalm 1a, and we will join in singing the psalm together.
Today's second lesson is unique in the sense that this is the only time that it pops up in the series of readings um, over the years. It's taken from Paul's letter to Philemon. Uh, we read verse 1 and verses 7 through 21. Philemon had a slave by the name of Onesimus, and Onesimus ran away and ran to Rome, and there in Rome came into contact with Paul, and through the ministry of Paul became a Christian. And now Paul seeks to send Onesimus back. Now, obviously, you can understand there's tension here. He's left Philemon, right? So how is Philemon going to treat him when he comes back? Paul calls upon Philemon to receive him back, not as a slave, but as a brother in Christ. Now, again, when we think about laying down uh, those things that we love and picking up those things that we loathe, Paul is obviously calling upon uh, Philemon in the name of following Christ to make, in a sense, from a worldly perspective, an extreme sacrifice. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and co-worker, for I have received great joy and encouragement from your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed by you, brother. For that reason, even though I have plenty of boldness in Christ to order you to do what is proper, I am appealing to you instead on the basis of love, just as I, Paul, am an old man and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. I am appealing to you on behalf of my child Onesimus. I became his father while I was in chains. There was a time when he was useless to you, but now he is useless, useful both to you and to me. I have sent him, who is my very heart, back to you. Welcome him. I want to keep him with me so that he might serve me in your place while I am in chains for the gospel. But I did not want to do anything without your consent so that your kindness would not be the result of compulsion, but of willingness. Perhaps this is why he was separated from you for a while, so that you would have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but as more than a slave, as a dear brother. He certainly is dear to me, but he is even more of a dear brother to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. And if he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, have written this with my own hand. I will repay it, not to mention that you owe me your very self. Yes, brother, I am asking for a favor from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I ask. The word of the Lord. for our reading from the Gospels. Today's Gospel reading, which will again serve as our sermon text, comes from the 14th chapter of Luke's Gospel. We begin reading at verse 25. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus. He turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, if he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, everyone who sees it will begin to ridicule him, saying, This fellow began to build, but he was not able to finish. 
Or what king, as he goes out to confront another king in war, will not first sit down and consider if he is able with 10,000 to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000? And if he is not able, he sends out a delegation and asks for terms of peace while his opponent is still far away. So then, any one of you who does not say farewell to all his own possessions cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its flavor, how will it become salty again? It is not fit for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown away. The one who has ears to hear, let him hear. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. We continue our worship with hymn 694.
want to encourage you to join with me this morning in giving your full attention to the gospel reading once again taken from Luke's gospel chapter 14. Um, our reading begins at verse 25. We obviously just read this a moment ago. So I just want to share with you the first few verses to remind ourselves again of what Jesus has said. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus. He turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. We bow our heads in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, how blessed we are to have this time together this morning. We pray for a rich measure of your spirit that we might take to heart the words before us and live them to the glory of your name always. We ask these things in the name of our Savior. Amen. Isn't it most irritating when you are hit with hidden fees? And I suppose one of the prime examples of that is when you book a motel room. This past, this summer, Mary and I on one of our trips had to stay in a motel and in booking the room she was quoted a price. On the morning when we checked out, that's not what we were charged. You know, you've got sales tax and local tax and this fee and that fee and before you know it, the cost for the night can be as much as $20 or more. It's the same thing if you book through Verbo. A lot of hidden fees. It's most irritating, isn't it? After his night at that supper in the home of the prominent Pharisee that we took a look at last week, Jesus now is back on the road. And what does he discover? Well, when he looks behind him, he's got a large crowd of people following him. Why? Why this increase in interest? Well, I think most of it is curiosity. What's he going to say next? What is he going to say that's going to irritate the Pharisees and the leaders of the people? Who doesn't like somebody taking a jab at the establishment? And then there's those miracles he does. Remember, he healed that man there in that Pharisee's home. What is he going to do next? What kind of healing is he going to do? How is he going to wow us and amaze us? They're following Jesus in many ways just out of curiosity. What you see Jesus doing in response is a very prime example of the difference between good and evil, between God and God and Satan. Now let's think for a moment if this crowd was following Satan. Satan was at the head of this group. Well, Satan is totally narcissistic. He cares about no one but himself. He is always looking at ways to pump up his own ego. And he would have seen this crowd as something for him to prey upon. And when you prey upon someone, what do you look for? You look for their weaknesses. And then you prey upon those weaknesses to take advantage of them and to benefit yourselves. And so Satan would have fed this curiosity. He would have strung them along, seeking to actually increase the size of this crowd. And his objective would have been to take everything from this crowd that he possibly could. And then when he had stripped them of everything that was useful to him, all he would have done is dumped them, kicked them to the curb, and left them there in despair and helplessness. He would have fed their ears with whatever their itching ears wanted to hear so that he could string them along in their euphoric state of ignorance. But that's not what Jesus does, is it? We see a totally different attitude here with Jesus. You see, Jesus doesn't care about numbers. What Jesus cares about is the truth. What Jesus cares about is souls. He's truly concerned about the individual. His thoughts are turned to what is the best for this crowd, not what's best for himself. When Jesus turns to this crowd and reveals to them all the details about what it takes to follow them. He's putting before them the hard, cold facts. 
You see, I'm like that motel bill. There's no hidden charges here. Everything is laid on the table. There's no surprises. Jesus doesn't, Jesus doesn't want anyone in this crowd to take one more step with him. If they're not willing to pay the price that it's going to take to truly be one of his disciples. You know, here again is another one of these examples of why you can be sure that this book we call the Bible is actually God's word. God never sugarcoats anything. He never withholds the facts. He never puts anything in fine print. He lays it out there on the table. He tells it like it is. Matthew Henry in his commentary quoting on this section says, Satan shows the best but hides the worst because his best will not countervail his worst. But Christ, and what you could put in here, best will abundantly. So here's what I want you to do. In your journey with Jesus, I want you to stop today dead in your tracks. And I want you to put yourself in the place of this crowd. And I want you to see Jesus standing before you and speaking directly to you. I want to take a look at what Jesus says here and what is actually involved in being one of his disciples. You see, before we jump on the Jesus bandwagon, let's see what the cost is to actually be one of his disciples. Let's see the peril that we are going to face in following him. And I also want you to know, which is the last verse of, next, the, next to the last verse of our text, where Jesus spells out what it is about when it comes to those who jump on the bandwagon but eventually jump off. Our study focuses today on this thought. Count the cost of walking with Jesus. In one of the adult courses that I use for my Bible information course in the fifth lesson, you find this phrase. Our redemption is free, but it was not cheap. What does that phrase mean? When it comes to our redemption, us being ransomed from sin, death, and the power of Satan, it came at an extremely high cost. What was the cost? It was the shedding of the sinless blood of God's one and only Son. But God offers it to us at no cost, doesn't he? He offers it to each and every one of us freely. So again, our redemption is offered to us freely, but it was not cheap. And although that salvation comes at no cost to us, it does come at a price. There is a cost in following Jesus. Now again, we're looking at, in these Sundays, hard statements that Jesus made in the course of his ministry. Now, they don't get any harder than the one that is before us this morning. He says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. So then any one of you who does not say farewell to all his own possessions cannot be my disciples. If my memory is correct, I thought the Lord told us we aren't supposed to hate. I mean, consider what John wrote in his first epistle. He says, everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life remaining in him. And yet, what is Jesus saying to us here this morning? He's saying to us that hatred is a requirement to be one of his disciples. In fact, go to John's Gospel, the 12th chapter. He says, anyone who loves his life destroys it, and the one who hates his life in this world will hold on to it for eternal life. Hatred. When we think of hatred, we generally think of it in terms that are psychological. These feelings, these very negative feelings toward something, opposite of love. Now, when those feelings build up inside of us, most generally, it leads to us then doing things physically. 
We might harm someone else physically. We might ultimately harm them by taking their life. And when we think about ourselves, hating ourselves, hatred of ourselves could lead to, well, self-mutilation and ultimately suicide. This cannot be what Jesus means because we know the fifth commandment, right? You shall not murder. You shall not take the life of someone else. You shall not take your own life. You shall not hurt or harm someone physically. You shall not hate. So what does he mean here? What he is saying is that we must be willing to quit that which is very dear to us. I'll say that again. We must be willing to quit that which is very dear to us. In other words, we must be willing to part with these things that are dear to us rather than quit our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Our relationship with Jesus is to be the most important relationship that we have, the dearest relationship that we have in this life. Our relationship with anyone else, our relationship with anything else, is never to interfere with that relationship that we have with Jesus. Now, the one thing is, is that we need to understand that when it comes to relationships, God has designed us to be in relationships. We need relationships. We need that interaction. I think that's very evident when you think about the fact that when God created the world, he created Adam and Eve, and we've got that first human relationship, we have marriage established there, right? But what he is saying here, that if we are to be a disciple of Christ, we are to hate all those relationships in the sense that we love them less than we love that relationship that we have with Jesus. The comfort and the satisfaction that we find in our human relationships must be lost and swallowed up in our love for the Lord Jesus. Let me give you an example of someone who put this into practice. Abraham. Abraham's 75 years old. Well established amongst his family. And what does the Lord God do? The Lord God comes to him at 75 years old. He says, Abraham, I want you to leave all this. I want you to leave this relationship with this community, your relationship with your family. I want you to leave all of it and go to a designated place. And by the way, I'm not going to tell you where that is right now. I just want you to start the journey, and along the way, I'll tell you where you're supposed to go. Abraham asks no questions. Doesn't argue with the Lord. He packs up and he leaves. This is what Jesus is talking about. When our duty to anyone in our life comes into competition with our duty to Christ, who must get the preference? Christ must get the preference. When we sanction sin in the lives of those that we have human relationships with and ignore the will of God, then we're not acting as one of Jesus' disciples. In fact, the reality is we, come up, we become a partner with that person in that sin. Following Jesus means making sacrifices and suffering. He says, whoever does not carry his own cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Following Jesus is to follow his example. Now I want you to think about this question. Why does Jesus come into this world? Did Jesus come into this world to take advantage of everything that is here? To take up residence in some huge, massive castle somewhere? Did he come here so that he might gain all the riches of this world and the adulation of all the people in the surrounding area? His life definitely doesn't, doesn't demonstrate that, does it? What his life does demonstrate is that he shunned these things to show us their real value. What Jesus came here to do was to pick up a cross. He came here to bear the sins of the entire world. He came here to rescue us from the from the judgment that we deserved in the end because of our sins. And in bearing our sin, what happens to Jesus? He suffers all along the way. I mean, he's faced with temptation directly from Satan, right? Satan comes to him face to face, trying to lead him down the path of sin. He comes using Jesus' disciples, the people around him, to lead Jesus into sin. Jesus suffered rejection. Jesus suffered disrespect. Jesus suffered injustice. 
And then he suffered the pains of crucifixion. Jesus denied himself. And he focused on what? He focused on the relationship that he had with the Father. That was his first and foremost relationship. And in his love for the Father, he was willing to put into practice his Father's will, which required him to love us, even though we were undeserving of it, and to give his life as a sacrifice to take away our sins. It wasn't the nails that held him to the cross. It was his love for the Father and his love for us. You know, the thing that you always have to keep in mind in the course of Jesus' suffering and death is that these people who were conducting this mockery of a trial who end up putting him to death, they were never in control of this situation. He was in control throughout the entire uh, process. He allowed them to arrest him. He allowed them to beat him. He allowed them to crucify him. He chose how he was going to die. They didn't. He did as we noted last week, he chose the most humiliating way to die, to suffer on a cross. And what did that lead to? He broke the chains that bound us in our slavery to sin, to death, and the power of Satan. You see, he's freed us from our eternal burden. Now, what he says to us is we are to be willing to pick up our cross for his sake and bear whatever comes in the process. To live for Christ is going to result in what? Being labeled in a very negative way by the world. And we see that playing out in our own country today. Take the life, in, uh, life issue, for instance. Think about how the world has truly geared up, especially because of the reversal of Roe v. Wade, especially now in these midterm elections. Take a look at how the world is gearing up to promote killing unborn children and disrespecting the life that God has given to us. Now, how do they react to anyone who stands for the opposite, who stands for life, who recognizes life as a gift from God? Some of the nastiest, cruelest things have been said, but even worse than that. I don't know if you're aware of this. There have been people across this country who have lost their jobs because they openly profess that they stand for life. There are individuals who have conducted uh, these investigations against those who are taking the lives of unborn children and when it has been found out, they have been arrested, they have been charged, and face imprisonment. If we stand for the truth, you know, truths like only those who believe in Jesus Christ are going to be saved. If we stand for the truth of sexuality as it as spelled out in God's word, if we stand openly for all truth of Scripture, are we that naive not to think? That ultimately, we could be arrested, we could be abused, we could be imprisoned? Are we going to pick up our cross and follow Jesus as he willingly picked up his cross for us and face whatever may come? Or are we going to take that cross and lay it down so that we can continue to be friends with the world and take advantage of the worthless pleasures and wealth that the world has to offer. We will only be able to bear these crosses and to stand for Christ in this world if we fix our one on the one who bore the biggest cross, namely Christ. Scripture says to us, let us keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, who is the author of our faith and the one who brings it to its goal. In view of the joy set before him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of God's throne. Carefully consider him who endured such hostility against himself from sinful people, so that you do not grow weary and lose heart. Anyone who has played baseball learned this lesson very early on. That when you step into that batter's box, if you want to be successful, there has to be intense focus. You need to follow that ball from the time it leaves the pitcher's hand until it strikes the bat. 
But the scriptures say to us that as disciples of Jesus, if we are going to follow him, if we are going to pick up our cross and follow him, then we are going to have to intensely focus on him. Each day, we need to intently focus on his word. Each day, we need to prayerfully study a portion of God's word. All of us need to study to sit and consciously, we've got an opportunity now. We've got new opportunities as this fall schedule will be kicking in. Pick a Bible class that you're going to be in. Shun whatever it is that seeks to interfere with your participation in that class. Pick one of those classes so that you can gain a deeper understanding into what that scripture says. Worship. In-person worship. Priority. Don't let anything in your life interfere with you being here every opportunity that it is offered to you. Don't take your eyes off Christ. He's your only true source of strength and direction. So why are you following Jesus? What's brought you to this place? Are you following Jesus? Have you really considered what the cost is? That's the point of those two parables that Jesus tells in the course of this. Do you realize that? You know, the builder, the guy who starts the project, but then all of a sudden finds out in the middle of it he doesn't have enough money to finish it, all right? Or the king who's going out to war, right? He sits down first and he considers who he's up against. He considers what the fight is really going to be about. That's what that part of the parable was about. What is the fight really like? If he doesn't have what it takes, then he's not going to go into battle with that king. Have you considered the cost? Have you considered what it costs to follow Christ? So many people have professed publicly as youth confirmands, adult confirmands, that they are disciples of Jesus that they believe that they have been taught the truth of God's word, and they're willing to actually sacrifice their what? Their life. Instead of abandoning Christ. Instead of forsaking him. And yet, a large percentage have abandoned him. Here's what Jesus says about people who do this. He says, salt is good, but if the salt has lost its flavor, how will it become salty again? It is not fit for the soil or the manure pile. It is thrown away. The one who has ears, let him hear. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said this of those who truly are his disciples. He said, you are the salt of the earth. If salt has lost its flavor, how will it become salty again? Then it is no good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled on by people. We use salt for a number of things, a lot of ways as a preservative. Most of the time, I suppose, when we think about it consciously, we use salt as a flavoring agent, don't we? We are to live our lives, Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, as the salt of the earth. In other words, we are to be the ones that are flavoring our community, flavoring our families, flavoring our work environment. He says if salt loses its saltiness, that flavoring, he says it's not good for anything. And it is a warning to those who have lost their saltiness. By that, I don't mean honoriness. But what I mean is that they're no longer living their faith and letting their light shine to the world. They're good for nothing except to be thrown on the garbage heap, Jesus says. And so it is that John offers us this warning. He says, watch yourselves so that you do not lose what we have labored for, but receive a full reward. Well, Satan is very watchful every day. He's looking for his opportunities to strike, particularly when we become smug and full of ourselves. We become extremely easy targets for him. Never devalue the, re the relationship that you have with Christ. 
Daily, as Paul wrote, let us be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can stand against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the world rulers of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. For this reason, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to take your stand on the day, on the evil day, and after you have done everything to stand. Arm yourself. Don't grab a few weapons. Fully arm yourself. That's the battle we're in. You'll notice here he reminds us, we're not fighting other human beings. Evil forces, much stronger than us, but not stronger than whom? Christ. And he has given us the victory. In his life, his death, and his resurrection. And that, res that victory is ours as we put on that full armor. And when you take a look at the words that follow that, it basically boils down to this. The gospel and word and sacrament by the power of the Holy Spirit working through those. And notice what he says. If we do that, not a question of whether or not we will be able to stand against these forces. The rewards are worth the struggle. Now, first of all, as we seek to put God's will into practice and shun the ways of the world, we will reap natural blessings. Now, I haven't become here this morning a prosperity gospel preacher suggesting to you that you follow Christ and your pockets are going to be overflowing with money and you'll never have to go see the doctor again because you're always going to be healthy. It's not what I'm saying. That is a bunch of satanic nonsense, okay? Only to rob people of what they have. But what I am saying to you is, and, and you find this throughout Scripture, I mean, that was in Psalm 1 that we had today for our psalm, is that we reap natural blessings by putting God's will into practice, and we reap natural consequences if we don't. And we have this wonderful promise as God's children that there isn't one of us here today, if we are in Christ, that we have anything to worry about for the future. God is going to graciously take care of our needs until it's time for us to leave this world. That's the assurance we have. But that being said, the full reward is going to become evident when? When we pass through the great judgment in the end, and we do so with a not guilty verdict. And then we enter into that new heaven and that new earth which God is going to create for us. And then that vision that you find in Revelation chapter 21 and 22 looks pretty good to us as we struggle right now in this world. Because what does he say there? No more death, no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain. People are going to be healed of all the things of body and mind that make them sick right now. Why? Because the curse of sin is going to be taken away. And what are we going to be able to do? You and I are going to live in perfect safety and joy with the Lord for all eternity. All eternity. All of us have been surprised by hidden costs. Probably we will in the future again. Not pleasant, but it's going to happen. That's the way the world operates. But before you take another step with Jesus in your, in your walk with him, I want you to count the cost of walking with Jesus. He doesn't hide it from us. He tells us that the cost is steep, steep but the rewards, they're astronomical. May you and I never grow weary in our walk with our Savior. But may we encourage one another to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, yearning for the day when we will be glorified with him in his kingdom, not because of what we have done, but strictly because of his grace in his son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please rise. May the peace of God which surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please join with me in making confession of your Christian faith. We do so on the basis of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. 
The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please remain standing. We pray, dear Heavenly Father, as we consider our discipleship, we recognize the fact that we are only followers of your Son by your grace. From beginning to end, from the plan to the execution of it, and now making it possible for us to trust in Jesus as our Savior, it is all strictly because of your grace. You have offered it to us freely by faith in your Son. But we recognize the fact today from your son's own words that this discipleship does come with a price. And that is if we put our lives in a direction that imitates his life, we will bring upon ourselves the wrath of the world around us. We certainly will be faced with difficult decisions as it comes, with our, comes to our relationships with other people, our close relationships with other people and the things that we own. Help us never to treasure those relationships more than our relationship with you. Help us to be guided by the principle that we are to love you with all our heart and with all our soul and with all our strength, so that they, we then may in these other relationships conduct ourselves in a way that brings glory to your name. As we pick up our cross and follow you, may we never grow weary in the journey but help us to keep our eyes fixed intently on your son and the ultimate sacrifice that he made on our behalf without any complaints so that we may go through this life with a smile on our face no matter what storm clouds might be brewing in our life, knowing that ultimately, because of your grace, we will enter into your perfect kingdom for all eternity. Help us always to keep our eyes fixed on the finish line that we do not grow weary, but bring glory to your name in all that we do, and that through us, others might be, might be brought to the knowledge and understanding of Jesus as their Savior as well. We ask all these things in the name of our Savior, who has also taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Almighty God, we thank you for teaching us the things you want us to believe and do. Help us by your Holy Spirit to keep your word in pure hearts, that we may be strengthened in faith, guided in holiness, and comforted in life and death. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Please be seated. We close today's service with hymn 697.